ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and everybody in between. Welcome back to another episode of the Hoops Crew. My name is Jake, here to discuss with you the retirement of a Geelong Premiership player, one of my favourite players uh, that I've ever watched, Don the Hoops. I know that might be a controversial one, um, but we're talking about favourite, not greatest. Um, the one and only, the legend, Zach Tui, has called time on his career at the end of this season. So whenever this campaign ends, it will be uh, full time on Zach Tui's career. What has been a remarkable career, I think, full of you know plenty of highlights. Um, a significant one for me comes against the Melbourne Demons in 2018 uh, when he kicked the winning goal after the siren. Hawkins, you know, sort of stole Tom Hawkins' thunder on a night where Tom Hawkins kicked seven goals. Uh, it was Zach Tui that put the icing on the cake after the final siren had gone. I was very, very excited about that one. Played 286 games so far. I suppose that's one of the difficult things when you're talking about a player who's retiring is that all these numbers will keep getting added to the games, hopefully the goals too, but 286 games played so far, the most by an Irishman. Uh, I think that puts into uh, context the, the greatness of his career. There's been some pretty amazing Irish players come over to play the Australian game and none of them have played as many as the great Zach Tui. So that's a record I imagine will stand uh, with him for a very, very long time. Zach Tui was a favorite of mine before he even came to Geelong. I used to watch him play for Carlton and think, oh gosh, it'd be nice if he played for us. Uh, I just enjoyed the way he went about it, the, the speed and aggression with which he took the game on. I thought it was you know, an important thing that he brought to the Cats once he crossed over. Um, you know, he was a combative player, whether that was, you know, running with the ball, um, kicking the ball, you know, such a long, um, beautiful kick of the footy. I'm going to miss his fashion sense, you know, socks up. I'm a big believer that you should be fined for not wearing your socks up, <laughs> um, which is an extremist point of view, but uh, I'm happy to stand by it. Uh, Zach Tui, the long sleeves, the long socks, the stash. He was certainly a throwback player in that sense. And also a bit of a throwback in terms of how he played the game in that attacking way, um, just taking it on. It's obviously, you know, had to be managed through the last couple of seasons, particularly this one. You know, he's needed that extra rest. He's just been such a valuable role player for the Cats. Um, particularly, I think, the last... I mean, obviously he was valuable in the premiership year, but I would say the last couple of years in 2023 and then this season, he sort of played wherever they've needed him, wherever there's been a hole to fill. Like we've seen him play, you know, off the top of my head, down back, up forward, on the wing. I'm almost certain there were games where he lined up on ball. Might have been against the Bulldogs last season at Marvel. That was a game where we really tinkered with things and we had Tyson Stengel at a few stoppages. and. Um, He's been a very selfless role player, I think. Um, and something that's probably a bit less tangible, and some people might roll their eyes at it, and that's okay. You're allowed to roll your eyes at it. But I think he's been an upholder of, of culture at a really uh, important time of transition for the Cats after the Joel Selwood era came to an end. There's a little thing that stood out to me, I think it was last season or maybe earlier this season after a win, and there was, I think, a Channel 7 cameraman got in the middle of Geelong's circle, and it was Zach Tui who spoke up and kicked him out of the circle and said, media on the outside. And I don't know, I'm probably reading too much into it, and fair enough if I am, but it sort of stood out to me as something that, like, there were traditions, I feel like, that were established under Joel Selwood that I feel like, and this is just me speculating from a million miles away and reading between the lines, but that players like Zach Tui would uphold, that that would be an important thing for them, that, that they would understand, you know, the little bits and pieces, whether it is, you know, the way you train, the way you prepare, um, all those things that, that go into 
maintaining that standard. And I feel like that's why it's been important um, for, for some of these older players who, you know, at different times, our fan base has said, oh, it's time for him to go. You know, whether it's Reece Stanley or Zach Tui or Mitch Duncan, uh, even Tom Hawkins, it's why it's been important for them to be around. Um, in 2023 and this year and and for those of them that play on uh, beyond this season because they carry with them parts of that great dynasty that we had, part of those great eras that we had. Uh, It's funny. I I think it's important, basically, uh, and I think it helps set the platform for what's to come. It makes sure that standards don't drop. Uh, and it makes sure that the goal is always excellence. And I think that's what I've loved about Zach Tui is his hunger to win, his hunger to play, obviously, as I said, more games than any other Irishman, but the hunger to get that flag uh, was was obviously immense, and he was a big part of, of driving it um, all the years where we got close too and didn't. And hopefully we can get him one more. and. I think then he can enjoy his retirement. I think he'll enjoy it regardless of what happens in the next, you know, six weeks. Um, and hopefully we get to see him go over and play a few games uh, for Port Leash um, in the Gaelic football. But yeah, massive thanks to the Moroccan Sunset, uh, one of my all-time favourite Cats players. If I'm being completely honest, definitely. I-, I think I think he'd make my top ten. Honestly, wanted to transition from that chat about Zach Tui into a chat about, you know, the development of this Geelong list. We're going to finish this little video uh, having a talk about Mitch Hardy. But in between times, I keep getting reminded this season and last, to be honest as well, of that sort of post-2011 premiership um, sort of era. 2011, we had Brad Ottens, Darren Milburn and Cam Mooney retire, and I may have missed some in here. I'm almost certainly will have, um, so just excuse me that little um, that little mishap. But I've included the ones that that came to mind while I was doing my prep notes. So Ottens, Milburn, Mooney retire after the 2011 flag. 2012, we lose Scarlett and Wojcinski. That year, we go 15 and seven, and lose an elimination final. In 2013. Joel Corey retires. Paul Chapman leaves for Essendon at the end of the year. Uh, We go 18 and 4 and lose a prelim. 2014, Travis Varco uh, goes for Collingwood at the end of the year. We go 17 and 5 and lose a semi final. 2015, Steve Johnson and James Kelly leave. We go 11, 9 and 1 and miss finals. 2016, Jimmy Bartel, Corey Enright, Matthew Stokes all retire. We go 17 and 5 and lose a prelim. 2017, Tom Lonergan, Andrew Mackey retire. We go 15, 6, and 1 and lose a prelim. 2018, we go 13, 9, lose an elimination final. 2019, 16, and 6 and lose a prelim. 2020, 12, and 5 and lose the grand final to Richmond. 2021, 16, and 6 and lose a prelim. 2022, we know what happens. A magical run. We win the flag. So 2011, we win a flag that's followed by a host of retirements, particularly that sort of first four or five years. My point, I guess, being in that time when we had these players retiring, we continued to win. You know, I think if you told some Cats fans um, at, at the end of, say, you know, 2012 or 2011, you know, after that flag, look, across the next three years, you're going to lose Ottens, Milburn, Mooney, Scarlett Wojcinski, Corey, Chapman, Varco, Stevie J and James Kelly. On the year after, you're going to lose Bartel, Enright and Stokes. Oh, and the year after, Lonergan and Andrew Mackey. And in that time, you're going to go to three prelim finals and not have a losing record. I think a few Geelong fans wouldn't have believed you, to be honest. The cliff was promised and the the cliff never managed to sink its claws into us. So I guess I'm reminded of that era a lot at the moment. Um, After we win that flag in 2022 and Selwood retires, we then miss the finals last year. And everyone said, it's it's time. It's going to be time. The Cats are going to slide off. Well, this year we're 14 and 8. We've got one game to play. If we win that, we finish in the top four. And who knows what happens in finals. But we will have made finals again. We will have made top four again. 
2025, who knows? But we know right now that Tom Hawkins is going to retire. Zach Tui is going to retire. Patrick Dangerfield's 34. We kind of feel pretty confident, I think, on the Hoops Crew network that he's going to play on. He's said as much. Um, I think that he's, that he's was it a two-year deal or he, or he wants to play on for a two more years or something? Reese Stanley, though, he's 34 in December. Mitch Duncan, he's 33. Some uncomfortable names here. Mark Blixarves is 33. I feel like he's still got plenty of good footy left in him, but the reality is he's 33. Cam Guthrie is 32 and has pretty much not seen the footy field significantly in the last two seasons. Jed Buse is 31 in December and has played most of this season in the VFL. So I feel like at the moment we are going through a lot of what we went through after 2011. Uh, where a lot of familiar faces, a lot of the brand names start to move on and new faces start to cycle through. Now, the reality is not all of those new faces will be here in four or five years. They might not even be here in two. They might not even be here um, in 2025. There's going to be a bit of churn, um, just like there was during those years where we were still making prelims but the cast of characters was changing and we were trying to find that next premiership winning combo. So with that in mind, um, and I think a big part of what Geelong were able to do was to keep topping up. And it's not just with superstars um, like Patrick Dangerfield coming in during those sorts of phases, Jeremy Cameron, etc. It's also Geelong bringing in players like Zach Tui. Players who maybe hadn't won a flag elsewhere, hadn't, you know, that they weren't superstars of the comp, but they were experienced players with a lot of games under their belt, maybe in their sort of mid to late 20s, who knew the business of being a professional football player. And so I think that's why you can look at Geelong's current list development and you're saying, well, why hasn't this player been forced out. Why, why has Mark O'Connor, you know, been extended? Uh, he's playing mostly VFL or, 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 you know, you look at when they bring in Sean Manor, when they draft, you know, someone like Mitch Hardy during the mid-season draft. This is part of that top-up process. You don't just add elite players. Part of keeping the list competitive and, and perpetually competitive is making sure it's not just filled with youth. And I personally don't see why we have to be pessimistic about Geelong's, not just the distant future, but, but the near future. Just take out this season, for example, and, and look at next year. You know, the likelihood is we're going into 2025 with Tom Stewart, Jeremy Cameron, Patrick Dangerfield, Jack Henry, Zach Guthrie, Tyson Stengel. I mean, speaking of another player that Geelong picked up and gave an opportunity to, Tyson Stengel. So there's those sorts of players in the midst of the best years of their career, uh, Dangerfield sort of on the fringe, but um, in terms of his age. But then there's the youth movement that's happening as well. You've got Max Holmes, you've got Ollie Dempsey, you've got Lawson Humphreys, you've got Shannon Neal, you've got Tanner Bruin. So I don't think there's any reason why you can't leapfrog from one era of success to another. But I think to do that, part of it is bringing in more depth experience, maybe some guys who will spend some time in the VFL. But winning a flag to me isn't about what you do with your best 23. It's like your best 35. It's your best, you know, 40 players. Like you want quality to draw on. And so I think that's what's happening. I think that's why you see, you know, players like Sean Manor brought in. I think that's why Geelong used, not every team does use their mid-season draft pick. The Cats used it on Mitch Hardy. And, and just to speak quickly on Mitch Hardy, I know there's a lot of sort of fatalism about him, sort of like, if he hasn't played already, he'll never get a go. You know, the, the Cats, you know, they're, they're, they're not even looking at him. They're not even considering him. I don't, I, I, again, I'm sort of looking at it from a million miles away. I, I've watched every game of the VFL um, that Mitch Hardy's played. I watch it every week on, on the Hoops Crew Patreon channel. I do previews and recaps of all the VFL games, men's and women's. And I, 
you know, round one this year, I did not see a player in Mitch Hardy that was ready to take an AFL opportunity. I thought there were still things that he was working through. I didn't think that he had the level of athleticism um, to play at the AFL level yet. I didn't think he probably had the fitness, the tank, um, overused term there, to play at the AFL level. But the different footballer he is now, um, you know, with round 21 of the VFL season having just concluded and finals being on the horizon and what he was then is pretty night and day to me. Like he's racked up touches the whole time he's been here, but it's that eyeball test, I guess, when you look at how he's doing it now and how he's finishing games and how he's pressuring. And that was a big one for me at the start of the year when people would tweet and say, do you think Mitch Hardy will get picked this week? Um, I had some like concerns about his ability defensively and would he get exposed defensively at the next level? First 10 games of the season, uh, he averaged 3.8 tackles per game. The last seven weeks, so essentially the last two months of footy because they had a buy in there, he's averaged 7.2 tackles. So he's pretty much doubled his tackling output across the last two months of the season. He's averaging five more disposals the last two months than he did in the first 10 games of the season. I think he's up to uh, 32 per game, and it was 27. And he's hitting the scoreboard more. Across that first 10 weeks, it was 0.5 goals per game. He's kicked a goal a game the last seven weeks. So I, people sort of get angry about it, and they get frustrated about it, and say, why hasn't he played yet? Why hasn't he played yet? Honestly, until the last, say, six or seven weeks, I didn't look at Mitch Hardy and think he was ready to take that opportunity. Uh, he's changing my mind week by week. I think he's getting, and it's not about just building numbers. It's not just about stacking 30 disposals, 30 disposals, 30 disposals. It's about how he's doing it. It's about how he looks. And I think that he, he's looking more and more impressive every week. So I, I don't fall into the camp of people who think because he hasn't played, he's never going to play, um, that he's going to be delisted, that he'll go elsewhere and succeed, and why, why Geelong, why, why won't we play him, and all this sort of stuff. I think everything is a process. Um, and that's not saying he's guaranteed to play this year. I don't think he, you know, I'm not saying he's guaranteed to play in 2025 or get a contract at the Cats in 2025. But Geelong aren't stupid. They don't often get player evaluation wrong. I mean, you look at two examples this year. Um, Sean Manor comes into the side early. He gets dropped after a few weeks, goes back to the VFL, slowly builds towards an incredible game. Uh, I can't remember if it was against Port Melbourne or Sandringham where he kicked six goals and had 20-odd touches and half a dozen clearances and laid 10 tackles. Comes back into the side and hasn't been dropped since. Lawson Humphreys plays the first 10 games of the VFL season. Everyone's begging for the Cats. Put him in, put him in, put him in. They resist, resist, resist. They finally pull the trigger on him. He doesn't get dropped again. For me, that is proof of the Cats know when they're ready. And it's why someone like Jai Clark comes in and comes out. He's not ready. It's why Ted Closey comes in for a little bit and then comes back out. He's not ready. It's why players like Mitch Nevitt, they bounce in, they bounce out because they're not quite ready. So I'm, I'm certainly not giving up on the idea that we might see Mitch Hardy really soon like really soon, <laughs> like he might play against West Coast. Who knows? I'm recording this on Wednesday night. Um, but I also think there's, there's a strong case to be made that he gets a one-year extension next year. I think I would like to have players like Mitch Hardy, even if they are playing mostly VFL, because it's depth. If you have you know four midfield injuries ahead of him, he's there. Um, and I think he's a much better player. And you've got to remember, too, he didn't come via a, a traditional pathway. He hasn't been in the AFL system since age 18, building that elite fitness base. He's come in, you know, what is he, 27? Um, and, and so he's had, at least my speculation is, he's had some ground to make up. So that's my thoughts. That's my broad-ranging thoughts from Zach to his retirement absolute legend, um, a privilege to watch him play for the Cats, to win a flag with the Cats, and to, uh, you know, through talking about that transition of a list and still remaining competitive and contending while you do it into the reason why I think, um, you know, Mitch Hardy delisted 
isn't a done deal and why it's possible that he may yet feature and be there in 2025. All right, hope you've enjoyed this video. Uh, I appreciate you for watching. If you'd hit that subscribe button, uh, I don't know which side of the screen it's going to come up on, one or the other. Uh, if you hit that subscribe button, we'd really appreciate it. Go and check out all the other stuff on the Hoops Crew Media Network. We've got that Patreon, which you know includes a bunch of extended podcasts, coverage of the VFL men's and women's, and a bunch of other stuff as well. Wednesday news shows with Ben. Anyway, that's all from me. Chaps Chat Cats will be back in your ear holes back in front of your eyeballs tomorrow night, Thursday, with a Cats v. Eagles preview. Until then, go Cats!